Hi everyone, I'm Terene. Um, I'm in the Department of Health Systems Biology here at U of T, and today I'm going to be talking to you about um, how we found these proteome-wide signatures of function in highly diverged disordered regions. So um, this is because I've never heard anyone at Torbuck talk about disordered regions before. Um, a quick definition of what they are. They're basically regions of proteins that don't have a stable secondary or tertiary structure. Um, so in this animation, this protein has a folded region here in the middle, um, but these floppy, noodly regions are examples of disordered regions. So why do we care about these disordered regions, or IDRs? Um, first of all, they're widespread. Um, close to half of the proteome in eukaryotes is comprised of these regions. Um, they perform many different functions in the cell, uh, which are listed here. So protein interactions, um, they're rich in modification sites. Um, they've also been associated with membraneless organelles, which are thought to form through phase separation, which is a very hot area right now. Um, and also we know that mutations in IDRs are linked to human diseases, such as cancer and neurodegeneration. So um, despite what we know, so we know all of this uh, information from individual studies in proteins that have disordered regions. Uh, so despite this knowledge that we have, the vast majority of these regions actually remain uncharacterized. So um, why could that be? Um, well, we know that usually when we're looking at proteins and trying to do functional analysis of them, um, we look for these conserved residues in multiple sequence alignments. So an example here is in this alignment, you can see there's a motif here that's very well conserved. So we would ascribe or hypothesize that this um, region of this protein has some important function. Um, however, these conserved motifs only make up about 5% of the total amino acid residues in IDRs. And so, 95% um, of these regions are actually not looking like this. So we wondered, what are these things doing and what do they look like? So um, an example disordered region from that 95% of that pie chart is this one. So here I'm, I'm just showing you um, an example from the protein C50 in budding yeast. Um, and if you look at the um, protein alignment for this disordered region, you see virtually no homology, even though um, the flanking domains in this protein are very well conserved. So, um, we, so one question that arises is sort of what in here, if anything, is functional? Um, is there anything going on in these regions? And one sort of uh, thing that's come to light in the last decade or so is that these disordered regions can contain um, these molecular features, which are uh, higher order features in their sequences that have been associated with different functions. So some examples of these are uh, things like net charge of the disordered region, um, different types of repeats or general complexity, um, and things like the separation of charged and proline residues versus the rest of the sequence. So these are, um, some of these examples of these molecular features that could be important for these regions. And so a question that we had about these molecular features is whether or not they're preserved through evolution, because that is sort of um, our test for knowing if they're important for protein function or not. So the problem that we have is that actually these, the typical way of analyzing protein sequences doesn't work for these regions. So um, like I mentioned, usually you would look at an alignment, you would look at a conserved, uh, or to see if uh, it's conserved or not, you would look at a column in the alignment, but you can see there is no signal for conservation in the columns of this example alignment. Um, but uh, one idea that we had was to actually extract these molecular features um, from the disordered regions themselves, so across the entire disordered region, and quantify them through evolution by using um, the orthologs of the sequences that we're interested in. So um, 
We can do this by using a z-score to quantify the distance between the evolution of a molecular feature in a real disordered region um, and comparing that to our null expectation of disordered region evolution. Um, I don't have time to go into how we form the null expectation, but basically it's based on simulations of IDR evolution, and it's all uh, been published before by our lab. So um, after we get a z-score for each molecular feature, for each disordered region, um, we can start to make these uh, vectors of z-scores, which uh, we have called an evolutionary signature. So um, we uh, think that this evolutionary signature basically summarizes the evolution of um, each of these molecular features. In this case, we have 82 um, for each IDR. So this gives us uh, a really nice way of quantifying um, these different molecular features that might be important in each disordered region. And so we can have a uh, quantitative way of uh, understanding how these molecular features are evolving in each disordered region. And you can see in this example that although um, there is, again, no sequence homology between these four example disordered regions, um, their evolutionary signatures um, actually indicate that three of them are pretty similar to each other, um, while one of them is very different. So they have uh, different signals in these two different spaces. Um, so what we can do with these evolutionary signatures is uh, we can get them for an entire proteome. So in our case, uh, we did this analysis on the yeast proteome. Um, and what we get out of this is a uh, global view of IDR function. So this is kind of our uh, result from our proteome-wide analysis. Each row here is um, an individual disordered region, um, and the columns are uh, the different molecular features. And um, basically here we use hierarchical clustering to understand um, if there is any structure in the data, if there are any disordered regions that share evolutionary signatures, and so on. And the really surprising thing that we found was that based on these molecular features in these diverged disordered regions, um, we can actually find uh, groups of disordered regions that share evolutionary signatures and that are associated with uh, very specific biological functions. So just some examples are um, these disordered regions associated with ribosome biogenesis, um, the nuclear pore basket, cytoplasmic stress granules. Um, there's various clusters associated with transcription, uh, signal transduction, the cell wall, um, and so on. So um, using this data, we can start to understand uh, which molecular features are associated with specific protein functions, which we think is very exciting. Um, I don't have time to talk about uh, <laughs> too many of these molecular features, but um, you can read about it in a preprint that I'll link later. Um, so one of the things that uh, we thought we could do with this data is, um, well, if there are certain uh, disordered regions that share evolutionary signatures, um, we hypothesized that we would be able to extract some functional information from them. So, um, for example, one of the clusters of disordered regions uh, that we found is strongly associated with uh, these mitochondrial and terminal targeting signals. So uh, the majority of the IDRs in the cluster are mitochondrial, and they're also enriched in mitochondrial phenotypes from the yeast phenotype data that's available. Um, and again, there's no detectable homology between the disordered regions in this cluster. Um, and so we hypothesized, uh, because they also seemed like they were mostly N-terminal, we hypothesized that these were mitochondrial and terminal targeting signals, which have actually been pretty well studied. So basically, um, the concept behind these uh, signals is that you have a mitochondrial precursor peptide, um, and there's an N-terminal targeting sequence which targets this precursor to the mitochondria, um, and eventually the uh, signal gets cleaved and uh, the protein folds as a mitochondrial protein. Um, so we thought we would test um, the sort of functional signal that we're getting 
uh, from our molecular features and from our clustering analysis um, by doing a sort of in vivo experiment. Um, so we asked, can IDRs with similar evolutionary signatures perform the same functions in vivo? So we actually tested this in our model bedding yeast. Um, so here I'm showing you just a wild type uh, precursor peptide for this protein called COX-15, and it has a GFP attached to it. So this is a mitochondrial localization. Um, here, uh, if we knock out the disordered region, we don't see any GFP signals, so the protein never, or the precursor peptide never made it to the mitochondria. Um, however, if we replace the wild type disordered region with uh, a disordered region from the same cluster, so this is from ATM1, and this is actually an uncharacterized um, precursor peptide, uh, we recover the mitochondrial localization of the protein. Um, whereas if we put in a disordered region from the neighboring cluster, again, we see no mitochondrial localization. So we think this is a uh, direct sort of evidence that uh, these disordered regions and the molecular features that we find in them um, actually provide us with some functional information um, and that we can use them to test hypotheses like this. So um, in conclusion, uh, we can quantify the evolution of molecular features in IDRs and summarize them via evolutionary signatures. Um, groups of IDRs with similar evolutionary signatures are enriched for biological functions. Um, and IDRs with uh, sim similar evolutionary signatures can rescue function in vivo. And so the, the sort of TLDR version is there's rich functional information in these highly diverged disordered regions beyond them just being disordered and beyond their conserved motifs. Um, and so we think it should be possible to predict protein and IDR function from these highly diverged uh, IDR sequences. So with that, I'd like to thank um, my advisor, Alan Moses, um, Bob, who helped with the uh, strains that we made for uh, some of the experiments, uh, co-authors, and all the lab members who um, provided feedback along the course of this project, and also uh, you can check out our preprint, which is up as of last week. Mm -hmm.